And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. Come, uh, the, <laughs> the man who hates his... Who hates time zones as much as I do, and is currently cr is currently developing the par the paranormal agent RPG known as Strange Squad. The one and only Sean, don't call him Gordon Murphy. Sorry, I had to get that joke out of my system. I'm pretty sure you've heard it before. Oh, that's so good. I actually don't doing? know what that's from, but um, I I mean I can Google it now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm. It's such an it. It was such an obvious one that I want. I wanted to get out of the way as quickly as possible. <laughs> right. Well, uh, yeah. Thanks for uh, having me on here. I don't think I've ever been like interviewed or anything before, so it's kind of cool. Yeah, and I. I happen I happen to come I happen to come across the project and I I figured this I figured this is right up the temple's alley so I reached out and the rest is history but a bit of a tradition is opening with the humble beginnings in a sense so walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick Oh it's fucking ages ago now um so first started when i think a mate's sister uh ran a game for us um like i don't know like eight years ago or something now um it went pretty well and then we kind of didn't do anything for a year or two um and then i decided to to pick it back up and i've kind of been the go-to gm for the people I know, uh, ever since, I guess. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I wish I had some, like, grand story, but we just played, um, like, a game of 5e or something. Um, and then slowly transitioned into other systems. Yeah, because... As I understand it, um, Strange Squad is using a D100 approach, and it's qu it's quite a leap going from the likes of 5e into D into a percentile system, essentially. Yeah, the math's a lot more upfront. Eh? Like um, I found with D20 systems or like modify systems in general. Um, they tend to be pretty swingy, right? Um, so I thought, you know, for a kind of more, more tactical kind of game, um, D100 seemed like a pretty good pick. Yep. And were there any... Now, I do... On the, in the first few pages in the um, document that you had sent, it did give a bit of the inspirations. Um, and I'd like to go through some some of these, and th and then later on ask on some on some of the tabletop inspirations, and just get a feel for what inspired you with that particular work, and what you try what um you tried to bring into in the development of Strange Squad. And I suppose the best place to start is Hellboy slash BPRD. Yeah. Um, Hellboy Sick, uh, the whole, like, that whole series and mythos, I guess, mm -hmm. um, has been pretty influential in general on me, um, both in, like, like, Meganolo's art style, which is very, like, noir -y, has been a really big influence, and then I guess more recently, um, the the way those stories are written like the kind of 
mixture of like myth and more modern influences uh, has been something I'm really interested in. Um, and then it all kind of came to a head when there was uh, a little while ago, there was like a official adaption, like Hellboy tabletop adaption. And it was all, um, it was all in 5e. It was a bit of a mess. So, you know, this is a part of the reason I was like, well, you know, I can do better than this. Uh, and I started working on, on the game. Yeah. Now, the next one is, of course, the X-Files, which I can't, which I can hear the whistling from the theme in my head even all these years later. Yeah, um, it's pretty good. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, that kind of like monster of the week style uh, of storytelling uh, is pretty pretty well suited to tabletop games just in the very way that they exist as a medium. You know, they're kind of episodic by nature, right? Mm -hmm. um, so kind of adapting that uh, and like working out what works uh, from the story beats uh, in the way those episodes are structured uh, was like a really big kind of point of study, I guess. Mm -hmm. So... With with that said, the next one, of course, this is the this is the massive massive um, rabbit hole that is the SCP Foundation. Oh uh, yeah, fuck! It's been like a while since I've looked at that page, so I don't even remember like what's in there. Um, this is like here's an easier question: yeah, What is, is it? This is in just there? coming out to me blind. Oh, <laughs> uh, what isn't in there? Actually, I do have an answer. Uh, XCOM should be in there, but it's not. Because <laughs> uh, this was originally like an XCOM type game, and then it became like something else. Um, no, SCP was like, has always been a really big, like, like an obsession uh, mm -hmm. for ages now. Um, I spent a lot of high time in high school not paying attention to my teachers and like reading fucking 8,000 can I swear on this? Oh yeah I, sw I swear okay. all the damn time on this show okay perfect uh, like 8,000 word long articles instead of paying attention in like English class um, and you know there's, there's like a really there's a lot of great content uh, there to kind of draw from mm -hmm. and Plenty, plenty of people have drawn from them, and and games in both the video and tabletop variety have sprung from that. Mm. I know that there's one other person who's using one SCP article as the basis for a um co a uh, comic book. I oh can't... yeah, I've seen a couple of those. Mm -hmm. That's quite cool. Yep. Oh, uh, and. The next one that I have on my list is um, Delta Green, and I'm I'm assuming we're talking the original Delta Green s series that was using Chaosium Basic. No, like the um, actually the more modern one. Um, I'm I'm a pretty I'm a pretty young individual, um, not that old. Well, I'm, I'm <laughs> not saying first edition Delta yeah, yeah. Delta Green, but. I, like, I, I mean um, to differentiate from from say <clears throat> the fall of Delta Green, which is using fate. Yeah, yeah, of course. No, the um the Arc Dream Delta Green has been like the most recent one mm -hmm. from the time that I've been around playing these games, and like it's it's pretty good. Um, so I've never found like a huge need to look back. Um. And play some of the older ones, um, especially since I think they do a really good job of like keeping the older modules um, from older editions updated and ready to use with the new version. Yeah. Also, I have I have to correct myself. It, Fall of Delta Green wasn't using Fate; it was using Gumshoe. I don't know why. I, thought oh, of, right. I don't know why I said Fate. But no, that's all good. 
Yeah, I'm get, I is was so, was stuff like Delta was stuff like Delta Green and and Cthulhu where you were first introduced to D100. Yeah, I think so. I I had touched a little bit of Call of Cthulhu before Delta Green, uh, which uses like a D100 system, but yeah. Delta Green was definitely the first time that we got properly invested in a D100 system. Mm -hmm. um, like, out of any tabletop game, I think it's probably the one that me and my group have played the most. Um, we just finished up a 21 session campaign of it, um, like the other week, actually. Um, so it's been a really big kind of influence on not just you know the the design and the stuff i write but the way that it's released mm -hmm. um i think they've really nailed down a good model with like just putting the game out and then having a shitload of really good adventures um to keep people on it right mm -hmm. and as I as I understand it, you're do, you're you're doing a um a very a very light affair in co in contrast to what say Call of Cthulhu or De or Delta Green does in regards to um character creation. Like the the agents that you ha that you have the the player characters that you have, there's not a exhaustive list of attributes and skills. You only got um, four stats, a couple derived attributes, and only I'd say about no more than 12 skills. Yeah, it's a pretty it's a pretty light system. Um, we're kind of hoping to go for a more pulpy um action -y vibe mm -hmm. uh, than those games, which tend to be pretty down-to-earth. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, of course, there's the, ho the whole thing with, um, pa with powers, which I did... I... I'm gu I'm guessing I'm guessing when it comes to powers there's there's a kind of sky's the limit approach where power where there's not really a hard and fast there's not really much in the way of hard and fast rules as far as what powers can be. Yeah, I mean it's like it's like with any tabletop game, right? Um it's all going to depend on the reading of people at the table what the limits are there. Um I've done my best in the text to give people like a, a scale of what's possible with them. Um, but, you know, they're definitely not like a D&D &D spell, for example, where it's going it's a very scientific language about, you know, it covers a 5 by 5 square for X amount of whatever, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And with that in, with that in mind the other th the other thing that i saw that definitely drew my attention was how you're handling advancement in regards to um evaluating through this protocol called peace which is definitely a unique approach how did um how did you come to the approach that you end ended up doing with that It's kind of an interesting one because it comes from a bunch of conflicting, I guess, design ideas in my head. Mm -hmm. um, I generally think advancement systems that, you know, progress characters for doing things that their archetype of character should be doing anyway um, are generally pretty sensible, right? Um, but I'm also skeptical of 
system like reward systems that try and encourage behavior players into certain modes of behavior um so kind of explaining it as this is what the agency wants you to do um and will reward you for doing though it may not always be the right thing to do was kind of my way of consolidating both those conflicting ideas into like one mm-hmm. system yeah and because of the way it's set up it sounds like you you won't have say the paladin problem that's been that's been a recurring thing for years <laughs> yeah oh you know the the paladin has to obey these certain rules or they don't get their features anymore the the th- the thing that made them a problem archetype for decades yeah i think it, i mean i don't think it's uh, necessarily always an issue because there is something interesting about being rewarded to engage in a very specific behavior and then choosing not to do it um because you think it's still the right thing to do right um but obviously players who are using that as an excuse to be like annoying or shitty um are always going to be an issue right mm-hmm. i can i can certainly get i can certainly get that um now, given given the nature and given the pulpy affair, um, are you le- are you leaning more towards um, ha- more towards high da- high damage and low health in order to ma- in order to maintain the ge- the general vibe you're going for, or is there or is there a different approach? It's pretty high damage and low health, um, like most attacks or weapons or whatever will take an agent down in like one or two hits um the kind of thinking behind it is most of the time you're operating in like civilian residential areas right Mm -hmm. um and you're trying to do this shit overtly so if you're in a fight you've already screwed up somewhere um and you know if someone's coming at you with a shotgun uh you're not gonna be able to Sprung off three shots of that, right? And I'm I'm guessing one of the other things that you ha- that you've put in to reinforce that is how each failed roll takes away one point of cool, which is essentially how your I guess I'd call it mental state, but I feel like that's not doing the whole doing it under um, doing the whole thing justice. Um, I think. W- the intent of cool is to be how well you how um well you can handle stress yeah it's like you're a measure of how much you can do it before you just lose it and do some dumb shit Mm -hmm. um but it is pretty similar to like i don't know sanity and delta green or call of cthulhu um but avoiding that was a pretty pretty intentional choice um a bit conflicted about how those games handle that. Oh, I the only I I'd say the only the only as much of a meme as it's become the only I'm I've always been kind of iffy about um the idea of sand check or or rolling sand because the things that are going to be messing with your head aren't. So, Aren't aren't really something that's going to have a random chance of success or failure. Yeah. Oh. Like, it's not it's not like say leap leaping, leaping from one from one edge to try and grab a lap to try and grab a ladder or something. There's a success that there's a there's a chance of the action succeeding or or failing. But with yeah. sand, you're you're rolling to not fail. That's always that's always been the thing that's been iffy to me about that kind of thing. Because mm. and maybe maybe you came to the same conclusion, but die rolls should be centered around the um 
what will what will happen if there's a, if the action is successful and what will happen if the action is not successful. That's an interesting way of looking at it. Um, I think saves have been around for a decent. Uh, I can kind of get behind that like action focused view of it. Um, it was more in the the intent behind it was more in the fact that I think the like mental health stuff some of those games do is like a little stupid, um, like a, sometimes a little offensive, but also like just kind of dumb, right? Like you see five dead bodies and you're all good, and you see six and now you have like I don't know schizophrenia or something. Like I don't know that doesn't seem. That just seems like a really weird way of doing it to me. I could only see that kind of thing in, say, paranoia, you know, which is meant to be a joke as it is. <laughs> yeah, like if you went really gonzo with it, then that's cool. Or, like... <laughs> or um, I always I was like pointing out the whole thing with with Nobby Knobs in Discworld, where he's described as so ugly he has to he has to carry official paperwork to prove that he's human. Mm. But this, but um, Discworld is go is going constantly Gonzo with it. I mean, one of yeah. the, one of the more famous stories is Death having to play as what's referred to as the Hogfather, but for all intents and purposes, is the universe equivalent of Santa Claus. So you have the Grim Reaper trying to be Santa. Yeah, I need to catch up to that one actually. Mm -hmm. Oh. And of course, of course, that got made into a mini series where death was voiced by the by the Grey Poupon guy. Make of that what you will. <laughs> but even now, it's funny that we bring we bring up um, SCP and and X Files and the and the like because X Files is ver is very clearly in the realm of. I wasn't going to say it's in the realm of science fiction, but that's not exactly the true. In all of those, in both of those cases, it is you're dealing you're dealing with a mixture of science fiction creature features as well as more occult, more occult. Um, with Strange Squad, do you lean do you lean more into the more more into the occult, more supernatural end, or the the science fiction end, or do you have that as a it depends on the table kind of thing? In terms of like what's been published so far, I think it definitely does lead into a more mythological, uh, supernatural vibe rather than like proper science fiction. Because hmm. um, I think there's I think there's a few games already that kind of go in that vibe. Um, and, you know, that kind of, that Hellboy inspiration is very, very supernatural based. Um, actually, originally in the, in the game's original scope, it was just demons. Mm -hmm. um, like there were no, there was nothing else, no ghosts, no vampires, no cryptids or whatever, like just demons. Um, but I think eventually it ended up opening up into being a, a kind of wider supernatural vibe. Yeah. And with the, within the, within that, um, when it comes to given when it comes to powers, given that the agents are sp are supposed to be aber supposed to be aberrants or um, Abe's in their in their in their own form. Um, what sort? Even though there's a lot of ways that powers can go, what sort of guideline do you did you tend to have when it came to um when it came to designing powers? Generally, like in terms of power scaling there's not a huge amount of consideration for uh like balance 
whatever that means, right? Like they're not all evenly matched up to each other. Um, the main guidance was like, will this power create more interesting scenarios than it removes, right? Um, by having this in the game, does it make it more interesting? Does it wider the amount of approaches than it versus it not being in there? Um, and whenever there was a power um, kind of proposed or thought about, because we had a, I enlisted a, a couple of my mates to come up with some, because there's a few in there. Mm -hmm. um, we kind of ended up vetoing any of them that were like, you can do this one thing and there doesn't seem to be any application for it outside of that very narrow um, use, right? Everything's going to have like multiple way uses in any given situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and with that in with that in mind, I know I know I say that quite a bit, but I'd like to shift into the three adventures that you had put had put up on the on the Kickstarter. Um. Oh. And just get a, just get a general feel for how they are go how they're going to be uh, working. What what sort of themes, what sort of tones you're going for for each of the adventures. And the first one I'd like to open with is buried in the quagmire. Yeah, uh, quagmire is uh, kind of an interesting little one. Um, I actually don't remember what incited me to to write about it. I don't know if there was like one piece of inciting media or anything that I saw. Uh, but in terms of like vibe and tone, uh, main creatures are cryptid, so it's got that going on. Mm -hmm. Um, but then I guess the other big one is there's this kind of weird religious undercurrent. Uh, to the town um, which is going on um, and it's not like a like a big reveal or anything like oh wow they were evil the church was evil the whole time or whatever um, like uh, I've seen some things do before but just kind of this pervasive thing <laughs> underneath it all I don't know mm -hmm. um, alright and Anti-reality dump site. That one's also kind of a weird one because there's not like uh, it's not really like a creature in there that you know it's not one where there's a creature that gets you. Um, it's more you're placed in an unfamiliar uh, sort of dangerous location, um, and you're doing your best to pull a bunch of people out of it who have accidentally got stuck inside. Um, kind of going for a more... almost like natural accident... Um, natural accident rescue kind of vibe rather than a, a classic creature of the week. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not to, that's not to say that... What, that one can't do one can't do creature of the week with this it's just not the limitation yeah there's just no uh there's just no creature mm -hmm. and well it's in a lot of the um a lot of the scp sto stories even though some of the more famous ones are ones that ha that have some sort of creature um I'd say a large amount of them don't. There's just there's it's some sort of object or some sort of concept that is just strange. Yeah, there's quite a few of them where it's just here's a weird thing. Mm -hmm. Now let's explore the logical consequences of what this weird thing would cause, right? Yeah. Out of curiosity, while go while going through it, 
well, going through and developing this. Has anyone brought up the game Control to you? Oh well, yeah, I love Control. That game's <laughs> sick. That's another uh, SCP-inspired mm -hmm. kind of game. No, I fucking love Control. It's a great game. Yeah, I um, I f I figured stuff like Control or qu or um, Quantum Break would be th would be things that would be brought up. Quantum Break to a lesser extent. Um, but control, especially due to the due to the nature of the of the oldest house. In fact, I'd say the oldest house would make a perfect um campaign. Would make a perfect almost sandbox. Not necessarily a mega dungeon style campaign, but something not far off. Uh, oh yeah, definitely. But I talked about it a while back on the show, and I had I had said that. Compared to Quantum Break, Control felt like a Remedy game. And I guess what I mean by that is it is it in, there's a certain style of humor that Sam Lake puts in a lot of his scripts. Not necessarily um, full full on laugh track stuff, but little little bits of fun, of Funhouse or even even absurd types of humor in contrast to the serious situation that you're dealing with. Um, and Sam Lake wasn't wasn't involved with the writing for Quantum Break, and it showed. <laughs> like, that story oh, yeah, took definitely. itself... It's not that it was bad, it just took itself too seriously. And Yeah, I'm looking at pictures of him now. He's got a very square head. It's like a cube. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd, I will I will admit that when I first saw the, the main firearm that you have in con, in control, the first thing I was I was thinking of was, wait, when when did we get the when did we get the gravity gun from Blame? Which Blame is an in I will note that Blame is an interesting, an interesting manga, um, one that was designed, one whose create, one whose creator Sutomu Nihei got his start in architecture and then decided to become a mangaka, and it kind of shows. <laughs> yeah, look at it like screenshots and shit now, and yeah, there's pretty pretty crazy architecture going on here. Mm -hmm. Oh. There was there was a adaptation on net. There was a CG anime adaptation that's on Netflix of Blame. I don't recommend it. I feel I feel like trying to do Blame in an animated form is missing the point. Um, because Blame works at its best when you're reading it in com in as quiet of a quiet of an area as you can. Because so much of it is atmosphere, and any sort of bo any sort of book that's ninety percent atmosphere is something that's hard to transfer into film or in into game. Yeah, but, isn't there like uh, eighty or so pages without dialogue or something? Dialogue in Blame is very minimal. A lot of the storytelling is environmental. Mm. But I suppose one of one of the other things I'd I'd want to ask about when it comes to the nature of the agency is if if um there's some if there's some sort of base or some sort of HQ that players are reporting to or if they're ju if they're just um activated agents within a general populace yeah there's like a central central hub it's in a, uh it's in Dublin Ireland mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of fun um i should probably write a thing at some point like expanding on it um, but generally, it's kind of a a leftover from when the game was still about like demons. Because mm -hmm. um, I was like, "Where's the most 
Catholic area I can think of. Uh, Ireland. So, you know, I just threw it down there. <laughs> the most Catholic area you can think of and you didn't and you didn't bring in Vatican City. Yeah, I mean, that probably would have been a better choice than <laughs> I think about it. Uh, not I'm I'm not saying do Vatican City. I'm j I just had to pull your leg on that. Oh, no, definitely. But I can, I, th I can see, I can see that because there obviously there's the there's the whole thing of the of the agency itself, and there's there's inevitably going to be the questions of who do, of who do they of uh, if they work for any particular government, which they probably don't for the same reason the MIB doesn't, or are there are there are there certain hubs that they're reporting to because because. It does. You did state in the um, adva in the advancement setup that agents are evaluated based on that protocol, and well, somebody's got to do the evaluation. Mm. Uh, I'm also curious if in the full in the full book, do you do you plan on putting in some story seeds as far as how people get recruited? I might do it in a, like a source book later on, uh, I reckon. Um, there was going to be uh, a little book kind of expanding on that um, originally for the Kickstarter, but it ended up getting axed because I wasn't happy with it. Um, but it's definitely something I want to look into uh, doing kind of later down the line. Mm -hmm. In the first versions of the game it kind of exploded into it and it was like a state or a states funded affair but that kind of got phased out um as the game evolved yeah that that certainly would make sense now with that in mind what would you be shooting for as far as a total page count for the book um let me pull up the pdf <laughs> I think it's like thirty pages or something, or thirty six, or I don't know. I can I can quickly check. I, it's not gonna it's not gonna expand anymore at this point. I just need to fill in uh, a few pages on my draw. And just uh, clean just clean the thing up so it looks like everyone knows what they're doing. Yeah, pretty much. Um, trying to keep it kind of lean uh, and mean. Yeah, 36 pages, um, all in all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can... I can get I can get behind that. And what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date, per se, but a general ballpark. In terms of... The, so the Kickstarter campaign wraps in about eight days. Um, and I'll be kind of getting my shit together once that happens. Um, in terms of like a final PDF release, uh, probably next month, and then print copies would be kind of a month or two months later down the line after that. Um, it really just depends on if shipping cooperates with us. I mean, most of the game is most of the game and the adventures are pretty much done. Uh, they've just got a few little more bits to do. Mm -hmm. I've seen enough Kickstarters where, like, it never really comes together that I wanted to have everything ready uh, before I started funding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could. I can certainly get that, and I. I will I will be looking forward to seeing how it develops. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Yeah, no, no worries. Uh, thanks for having me on. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory. But it is encouraged. Okay. What a sweet edit. And of course, a sincere, sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. 
and there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the Good Brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>